What is up, maniacs, and welcome to Broadened Horizon. This is episode 20. I'm your host, as always, Drake Riggs. On this episode, we continue to celebrate the two-year anniversary of Broadened Horizon with a very fun five-guest lineup ahead of Ryzen 39 on October 23rd. Kicking things off on this episode will be one of the big Super Ryzen winners, Koji Koji Tanaka, who defeated Jizzy in the Super Ryzen co-main event. Then the Ryzen president, Nobuyuki Sakigabara, joins us to recap the recent doubleheader and look ahead to the end of 2022. Su Chul Kim follows the boss and discusses his big upset win at Ryzen 38 against Hiromasa Ugikubo. Then the GO returns as we catch up with Megumi Fuji before closing things out with Ryzen featherweight champion Juntaro Ushiku. Ushiku defends his title in Ryzen 39's main event against Kleber Koike. Thanks as always to all of them for chatting, and thanks so much to everyone who has supported the show and asks questions for the end. Whether you've been watching on YouTube or listening on Spotify, don't forget to hit like and share if you enjoy. First up, we welcome Koji. All right, Koji. Well, it's great to see you, man. Congrats on the great win this past weekend. Just happy Thursday. How are you doing? I've been intoxicated this entire time since the... <laughs> Evan is in full party mode, man. Just living it up. <laughs> yes, I've been partying it up ever since. <laughs> right on. That's the way to do it. So, I mean, just as for this fight with Jizzy, man, obviously it was a great performance by you. Got the finish there. Just styled on him, really. Where does this, I mean, where does it kind of rank, I guess, against your weirdest experiences, not really just in fighting, but in life, because it was obviously a very unique thing. He's not a fighter. Just uh, where does it rank, I guess, amongst things you've experienced? <laughs> yeah, you know, Drake, I, I consider this a party. It was a big party. It was a, it was, it's super rising, you know? And um, I didn't consider this combat sport. I didn't consider it as competition. This was a straight up, it's a brawl. And uh, I, I, looked, I took this fight looking headed into it as a, as a brawl. And as a result, I think I am the only Japanese person to beat somebody affiliated with the money team. So that makes me feel good. Yeah, certainly a very good accomplishment to have when you look at it that way, man. And, you know, you've done these exhibitions kind of before with uh, Takanori Gomi, right? Who, an actual fighter, a legend of Japanese combat sports. Did it, this feel, you know, significantly different than that match? Because, you know, Gomi was also bigger than you, but was, was an actual fighter. Like, were they similar or was this a completely different thing for you? Like you said, it was a party, right? When I fought Gomi, I, I was weak as a fighter. I was not, I was not decorated, so I lost him. Um, but right now, if I fight Gomi, I can beat him. I'm very confident. I'm a different fighter than I, uh, than I fought Gomi uh, back then. But one thing that I did focus on for this fight was the Bob Sapp versus Ernesto Hoos. Ernesto won the uh, K1 Grand Prix three times. He was an all-time champion. And Bob Sapp didn't know anything about fighting. He was just green as they come. But Bob Sapp was able to beat Ernesto twice. And I was not about to follow his tracks. Because if I lost to a non-fighter, like an absolute beginner, I wouldn't be able to walk on the streets. So that's something that I really did focus on. So in that sense, uh, it, was it was very different than uh, fighting Gomi. Yeah, it's a very good motivation to have, man, and uh, ended up paying off just fine. And it did it just did everything go as you expected it to? I, I think that you know you were very close to putting him away there at the end of the second round, but you know got the job done in the third. So like, I don't know, was he tougher than you thought? Did did you do everything you wanted in there? Just like, how did it meet your expectations of uh, as you were going into it? Yeah, so my, I originally, I wanted to finish him in the first round, but uh, I kind of hesitated because he was a lot bigger than I anticipated. When, when, when we actually met him in the ring, he was so much bigger. And uh, I wanted to finish in the first round, but, you know, uh, I couldn't. And uh, he, was, he was a lot more, he was a lot better than I anticipated. Obviously, the skill sets are different. I have a much better skill set, but he was, he was better than I thought he would be. Um, he was tough and he was big. He was much bigger than I anticipated. So, um, yeah, those are my, you know, things that that went beyond my expectations. Fair enough, man. And, you know, combat sports in general, a very serious thing, you know, a very competitive thing to be a part of. But, you know, in cases like this or 
in general, do you think it's important just to have fun and fighting and maybe take things a little bit lighter at times? So I don't know, maybe you're not stressed out all the time. How do you look at it from that perspective of uh, enjoying just kind of this whole journey that you've had as a fighter? So I think uh, I look at combat sports as a tool to earn money and climb up the re uh, climb up the ladder in life. So I'm using you know combat sports as a tool. So in order to do that, in order to you know same as Mayweather, you know in order to earn money, you have got to train harder than anybody. You got to dedicate yourself to this sport sport more than anybody. So you know this is what I do. I train harder than anybody. I party harder than anybody, and I play with girls more than anybody. And uh, that's what I do to support you know eventually. I live a nice life and take care of my family. A true prize fighter, man. Very nicely said there. So with all that in mind, Koji, man, like, do you have an idea of what you want to do next and uh, maybe when, or is it too early to kind of think about that stuff? Yeah. So ultimately, it'd be nice to face Floyd Mayweather because, you know, all the guys in TMT, um, they're nice guys, but they're just big. That's all. I didn't feel any skill from them. And uh, they're just big Americans. So, you know, eventually I would want Floyd Mayweather, but meanwhile, I'd want to take those big guys without any skills out one by one and hopefully I get the big boss. You could be the money team killer, man. That could be a new nickname if you could pull this off. <laughs> so, yeah, I think uh, I'm, I've already started, you know, my first step as, as that name. Um, and uh, I think I'm the only Asian, Asian to, to become victorious over the money team. So I, I want to keep on fighting. I want to fight in the States. You know, if there's a, an event in Hawaii, I'd like to take part in it. And I'd like to fight another team, money team groupie. Yeah, it would be certainly cool to see, man. And, you know, we know you're a great kickboxer, Koji, but I'm curious, you know, having competed for Ryzen as many times as you have now, is there any interest at all from you to try out MMA or are we kind of beyond that? Are you not in interested in grappling at all? Just what are your thoughts on uh, MMA? Of course, I have, uh, I, I, have, I, am, I have interest in, in fighting MMA. All right, very cool, man. And I mean, just as for combat sports in general, how did you kind of fall into this path? I know you just said, right, that you want to make the money and, you know, all the fame and everything that comes along with prize fighting in general. But for you, was that the thought initially when you got into kickboxing and fighting? Like, how did it all begin for you? Mm -hmm. I started, uh, I wanted to prove that I was the best in, in street and brawling. I was the best brawler. All right. Fair enough, man. You've done a pretty good job of proving that indeed. So like if you never got into fighting, then Koji, is there something else you could envision yourself doing? Whether it's, you know, maybe one of your other passions outside of fighting, if you have any, like, what do you think you'd be doing if uh, you didn't fall into uh, punching people in the face, man? Uh, so I would, I would anticipate, uh, I, I'm currently an entrepreneur myself, so I think I'd rather uh, I'd still be an entrepreneur, being filthy rich, being a young entrepreneur with tons of money, or I could probably I, I might end up just being like a regular staff at a poorhouse. <laughs> All right, there you go. Definitely a, a, a unique approach to take, man. But uh, there's always options, right? So, uh, but as for fighting, though, Koji, like. You fought a lot of great guys in your career, man. Uh, legends, like we said, with Gomi, and you know, you fought Tension before, and uh, you know, plenty of other names. The list goes on and on. Is there somebody for you that stands out as uh, the toughest opponent that you've fought in your career? Uh, yeah, that's a hard one, Drake. That's a, that's a very hard question. Everybody was tough. Everybody I fought has been tough, but if I had to name a, a couple, it'd be Starus and Hirotaka Urabe. Those two are like very, very tough. All right, definitely some interesting selections there. And, you know, I did mention tension, but you also have fought Takaru, and those guys finally got to fight this year. I'm sure that you ended up, you know, watching their the match, their big fight that went down. And, you know, having fought both of them, man, you have a great perspective of, you know, how it went down and everything. So I'm curious, did it play out as you expected it to? 
いや、あんなに天心が圧倒するとは思わなかった。No, I didn't anticipate that at all. I, had, I did not expect Tenshin to be dominant as he was during that fight. I mean, when you look at that fight, you know, I, get, I think my fight versus Tenshin was a lot more,、uh, was better. And、uh, I fought better、uh, than Takeru did against Tenshin. You know, I, I think that Takeru is still a, it just showed that he's super weak. You know, with a guy like Tension, it's very interesting to see his career go on now and what he's supposed to be leaving kickboxing. And, you know, kind of a bummer because he's still very young. And I think fans would love to see maybe a rematch between them or, you know, a rematch between you guys.、Uh, do you look at those kind of things as possibilities ever between some of your past opponents and being like, oh, I'd love to get that one back? Yeah, if I had to pick some, I'd definitely like to fight to care again.、Um, I think I'm a much better fighter than him now.、Um, my boxing skills are much better now. And I'm very confident that I can beat him. And if he doesn't feel the, the merit of fighting me、uh, in a rematch in kickboxing,、uh, I can fight him in boxing or hell, I'll even fight him in MMA. So, you know, I know that he doesn't like me. I don't like him.、Um, it leads to, to a great story. Yeah, absolutely, man. Can't go wrong with that one. So,、uh, fingers crossed, maybe it can happen someday. That would be definitely cool. But speaking of kind of the tough opponents that you had and everything, Koji, I want to give you another tough question here, man. Like, when you look at all the accomplishments and achievements that you've had in your career, like, what is the proudest one that you have? Is there something that stands out amongst all your wins or maybe even little moments just along the journey? What would you say has been your proudest accomplishment? Uh,. So actually, there's two moments. The first moment is that when I was still not even before uh, recognized, uh, not even fighting for K1, I was still fighting in the local circuits、um, outside of the major cities. I was starting in small promotions. And、uh, I called out the, the current or the, the then champion, Urabe. And、uh, I got the fight. I was able to get that fight. I called him out. I got the fight. And I beat him. And、uh, that is definitely one of my proudest moments. And my second time. Is when I left K1 and fought tension. I was under a strict contract with K1, but I paid my penalties. I made the move and I made the fight with tension happen in Ryzen. So those two are the things that I'm very proud of、um, where I actually made my own actions and made、uh, my desires happen. Yeah, definitely some very good ones, man. And、uh, very, always great to be able to you know, make the dreams come true like that. And, You know, before I let you go here, Koji, you mentioned, you know, the first one there was before you were famous or well known, but now you're a very popular guy.、I、have a whole lot of fans, very passionate fan base, and a very just popular fighter in general. So I want to leave you with a fun question here, man. Like, what would you say has been maybe the craziest or wackiest fan interaction that you've had? If there has、uh, been maybe some, a story you could share? <laughs> Six. Yes. <laughs> yeah, so the first, the first thing he said was, you know, sex, right? But that was, that's not crazy enough. So、um, he said that、uh, he's received death threats because fans like him too much.、Uh, he received messages of, can you please end your life with me? Those types of messages he's been receiving. And he does remember that one time he had to do like a, an autograph session with the police guarding him、um, to make sure that he's safe. So those are kind of crazy experiences that he has had from you know, female fans. <laughs> wow. All right. Those are definitely some pretty crazy stories, man. Was that, is it scary to deal with that kind of thing? You know, that's like, that's kind of when you know you've made it, Koji. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's not scary at all. I don't really take it seriously. I'm not, too, I'm, not that intel- I'm not intelligent enough to think that it's scary. So I'm okay. <laughs> all right. Well, appreciate the honesty, sir. And、uh, yes, definitely. Definitely.、Uh, I could probably defend yourself for the most part with the fighting background. But <laughs> all right, Koji, we can leave it off there, man. Very fun getting to chat with you. Always fun getting to watch you fight, man. Total entertainer. Looking forward to whatever's next. Congratulations again on this first win over the money team, making some history, a good accomplishment, like you said. So, 
uh, very fun to see and hope uh, to, that you get to do maybe more of those in the future like you're wanting. So just a big thank you so much for taking time. Arigatou gozaimashita. And uh, wish you all the best. And I know you can continue the party right now for as uh, long as you possibly can, man. Don't uh, drink yourself to death <laughs> this time around, but have fun. Make sure you enjoy it. Drake, I had fun. Thank you very much. Let's do this again. Welcome back to the show, the president of Ryzen himself, Nobuyuki Sakikabara. All right. Well, great to see you as always, Sakikabara san, man. Just uh, how are you doing today? Happy Thursday to you, sir. Yeah, uh, pretty good. We are fine. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, coming off the heels of a big double header event. Uh, always a fun one when you get kind of, I mean, a halftime show this time. There was a lot going on. It was a big kind of fun party of a show, double header show that we had this past weekend. Just uh, were you satisfied with the turnout? How was the event from your perspective? Yes, uh, oh, oh, almost all fine. Uh, we are uh, satisfied. And I mean, I'm curious, like second time with Floyd, right? He's a big attraction, big star, one of the best boxers of all time, having him in the main event. How do you kind of compare the success of this event compared to the first time you had him with the tension fight? Obviously, you did things a little bit differently in terms of, you know, having him fight earlier rather than at the end of uh, the Ryzen 14 show the first time. Just how do you compare the success, I guess, of uh, both the first, the both of the two Floyd events you've done now? I don't First of all, you know, having Floyd participate in our event once, you know, it can be considered as some kind of a, an accident, you know, it's just a one time, whatever happened. But for him to come twice and, and compete twice in the rising ring, you know, I think that shows some kind of a statement. And uh, in, in a case, you know, in a way you look at it, getting him in the, in the rising ring for the second time, and that itself is a statement, and I consider that a success. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm kind of assuming then, did maybe he approach you for this return to uh, the Ryzen ring? Or maybe was it a collaborative effort? Like, how did it come to be in the first place to have him get back in there? You know, compared to the first, now that we've done this, we've done this for the second time, you know, compared to the first time, I just believe that, you know, uh, there is a huge difference in an amount of like relationship and, and trust amongst both parties. Because the first time, it was Floyd's first exhibition ever. It was his first fight outside of the United States. You know, they had their concerns. They didn't know what to expect. You know, this is the first time working with a Japanese promotion. They didn't know us. You know, there's just so many obstacles and concerns that they had. So now that we've done this for the second time, we do believe that, you know, we have a much better understanding on who we are, what each parties are for. And, you know, during the pandemic, even during the pandemic, we went to Vegas, we sat down and talked with them several times. And just, you know, it took time for us to build that relationship, that business relationship with them. So, you know, the, the obvious difference from the first one is that we have that trust amongst each other. And that made things a lot more smooth um, in terms of operation ones. <laughs> Yeah, that absolutely makes a whole lot of sense. And I guess it kind of maybe answers a little bit of the question with the main event, because I think a lot of people, uh, the co-main, excuse me, a lot of people were surprised to see, you know, Floyd's bodyguard, uh, you know, Jizzy having a fight in uh, Ryzen of all people. Not a, lot, not a lot of people were maybe sure who he was at first, but then it was like, oh, okay, it's uh, this guy. So how did I mean that come to be? Was that like, j just tell me kind of the story, I guess, because it was obviously something that caught us off guard. <laughs> Yes, so, uh, you know, like we mentioned, during the COVID times, we visited Las Vegas several times to, to, to meet with Floyd. And, uh, you know, throughout those visits, throughout those times, you get to know the people around him. And you get to talk to the people around Floyd. And obviously, one of, you know, one of the people around him was Jizzy. And, uh, you know, he's mentioned several times throughout the, uh, throughout the times we went to Vegas that he was showing his interest that he wanted to, you know, fight in Japan. He wanted to perform in Japan. So at the time, we didn't really have an idea, an angle on how to get it. You know, it's, it's very interesting for sure. It's, it's going to be very interesting, but we didn't have the right idea, the right story on how to get him on the resume. 
So, you know, we told him that, and the next thing we know is that, you know, during the Hawaii presser, he's up there, he's shoving Asakura, you know, he's gathering all the attention, and we were, and that's when we figured, you know, this is, this is, this is it. You know, he's, he gathered the information or the uh, attention that he deserves, so now we asked him, okay, so you got the attention, we can create the storyline, would you like to fight? And he said yes. So that's how it all got, you know, booked from there. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're getting very creative, sir, with all these types of uh, individuals competing for the promotion. And I remember on April Fool's Day this year, I mean, you were teasing us with the photo shoot of you putting on the gloves, Saki Gabara. So I feel like we're going to see you competing next. <laughs> yeah, that, that picture is real, but I have no intention of fighting whatsoever. So it was a, that picture was a true, it was a true April Fool's joke. <laughs> yes, it was definitely fun to see, though, that's for sure. Le leaves people imagining what could have been. But, uh, I mean, it's interesting, too, Saki Gabara. Like, you look at the first Floyd fight with tension, of course, and there were kind of these rumblings around that time, too. And it got brought up again here before this one uh, with Mikuru, specifically uh, Chael Sonnen uh, of some of the names. He was pointing out how he, he believes that Floyd's fights in Japan, you know, they're fixed, that they aren't real fights and this kind of thing. And just for you as the promoter and putting on these shows, like, is it frustrating to hear people kind of put those things out there and, you know, say that the fights aren't legitimate? Mm, well, I know. You know, um, one thing I'd like to say is that, you know, it's for those who have actually seen the fight, you know, it, it's hard to actually fix something like that. And if you just watch a fight, it's just super hard to, to understand or even acknowledge that it was a fixed fight. Um, you know, I've never met Chael Sonnen. I don't know Chael Sonnen. I don't, probably, I don't really know about him. But, you know, the fact that they are trying to get attention with what we make and what we do, you know, that itself is, I look at it in, in a good way. I don't really care what people say because at least they're talking about it. You know, and, and for me, I think haters are just as great as followers because they talk about it and they spread the word. So, you know, for me, I, it doesn't really bother me. And for those who have a legitimate eye, who actually watch the fight, I mean, they'll know if it's fixed or not. And they can, you know, they can make the decision themselves. Yes, a very good perspective indeed, and I think uh, very well said for sure. And, you know, just speaking of kind of all these big names talking about, I know you're always keeping up with kind of the things that are happening just in the MMA world in general. And, you know, having just had a big name like Floyd compete for you once again, we have a big name free agent out there right now. And Nate Diaz, who I'm sure you've maybe been hearing about, you know, he's a free agent now. So, I mean, is that somebody you would ever pursue? Obviously, he seems to be interested in boxing so i mean that is a possibility you could have for him do one of these standing rules matches if uh you know there was something you could agree upon there but is he a guy that you think would maybe be a very interesting you know personality to have in japan maybe somebody like the american version of you know the asakura brothers a little bit but is that a guy who i mean at least you're open to trying to maybe do something with well, yeah, so uh, Nick and Nate, Nate and, and Nick, you know, they both have a great personality. Um, their fighting style is very exciting. And, uh, you know, we've, we've known them, you know, since the Pride days. Actually, we've had Nick fight in Pride before, and uh, we've known them from way back. So, you know, if we were to do something with Floyd again, you know, it, we always have to talk about, you know, an, uh, an opponent. And, you know, we do think we're at a point where we can't just only focus on the Japanese market anymore and we have to target the, the international audience. So with that said, you know, Floyd's opponent doesn't have to be a Japanese uh, fighter anymore. So, you know, and that's, it's, it's just one possibility, you know, just thinking about the future. But, you know, not only, you know, Floyd's opponent, but, you know, Nate Diaz as, as an individual has a, has a great uh, amount of... He has a great character, fight style, and he has a you know, great following internationally. So as an individual, he would definitely be somebody we'd be, interesting to, we'd be interested to be talking to. Yeah, wow. I mean, I didn't even really put it together there that I guess there would be that possibility of Floyd versus Nate as an option for maybe a third, you know, Floyd fight in Ryzen. He did say what he wants to fight MMA fighters continually and uh, YouTubers or whatever it may be. So, I mean, Jisaki Gabara, that's a very interesting thought. I mean, how realistic do you think it is 
for you guys to maybe make that one happen. Diaz versus Mayweather in the Rise and Ring. That's a crazy idea. <laughs> <laughs> Floyd, you know, Floyd didn't. He's not. He's not. He didn't mention that he's only going to fight Japanese people in Japan. You know, obviously, his next fight in Dubai, he's fighting a uh, British guy from the UK, uh, probably a YouTuber or whatnot. You know, but you know, it, as long as we can provide something that people want to see and that people talk about, you know, that that is what as a promoter, that is what we want to deliver. You know, it's it's always nice to. Uh, to show you know the Mayweather exhibition challenges and whatever we can do to exceed people's expectations, you know that's that's the goal in in terms of announcing a fight. So whatever gathers attention, exceeds people's you know surprises people is what we want to shoot for. So with that said, you know it would be interesting to be talking to Nate and you know bringing up the idea to Floyd. ネイトとフロイドがやったらアメリカのファンたちはどんな感触になるどんな反響になると思いますか So asking you Drake what kind of what kind of reaction would the North American audience、uh, respond to if <laughs> we announced the Nate versus Floyd fight exhibition fight <laughs> Oh my goodness I think I think that would be If you look at kind of all the options out there Sagibar I mean that would be about as big as it possibly could be and A surprise. I don't. I haven't really seen anyone think about that. Everyone's thinking about you know Nate Diaz versus Jake Paul. That's kind of what everyone's fixated on, or maybe stuff with the Paul brothers. But if you throw in the Floyd idea and he says he wants to keep doing it, I think that would be maybe the biggest surprise and most interesting thing that could maybe happen. Honestly. <laughs> So, you know, Nate's kind of like the,、uh, the global Asakura brothers. You know, the Diaz brothers are the global Asakura brothers. And, and who would not want to see them fight, you know, take on Floyd Mayweather? You know, and,、uh, and Floyd's been doing, you know, he's been perfecting boxing his entire career. And now he's willing to, you know, do these exhibitions to fight different professions like MMAs, YouTubers. You know, and, and it's right now, I think it's the time. That is what sells, and that is what people、uh, are entertained by. And you know, these big、uh, competitions, exhibitions amongst different professions, is something that really gathers attention and gets people talking. And you know, like we said, like I said earlier, you know, we, we need to not not only focus on the Japanese market now, but we really want to focus on the North American market. And、uh, you know, if if these types of matches help us. Get attract、uh, attention, and globally and especially in North America, you know that might be the thing that we want to do.、Um, our angle, our our way of putting on con- making content is to to entertain people and、uh, deliver the content internationally, and and it, pretty much entertain the people who watch. So that's that's where we're coming from. Those that's where our ideas are coming from. Well, if it was to do it. See the you know the, the better chance of you know if if, if Nate Diaz even might have a chance of being Floyd you know and for us to promote that fact that what if factor is definitely something that uh that we need to promote for these exhibitions、uh, against Floyd so you know making the people think maybe you know what if that if factor you know Nate Diaz can bring all of that so we do think it's a great idea. Yeah, I think、uh, we're definitely onto something here, Saki Gabara. That、uh, <laughs> I've got some serious potential. See what can be worked out. But、uh, man, yeah, that's a fun idea to think about for sure. But、uh, what has also been fun so far, man? Looking back at this past weekend, you know the Adam White Grand Prix continued. Got the semifinals. We know what the finals will be now, right? That's the first fight technically for、uh, New Year's. We'll see Saki Zawa versus Siwoo Park, the rematch to close out the tournament. Just as for this whole thing this year, has、uh, the tournament kind of panned out as you expected it to, or have there been some surprises with、uh, who's gone on to win and whatnot? Do you think about that? Ma, I know, 本当に Yes, the, you know we do believe that the, 40, the, the atom weight、uh, the division, the forty nine kilos, the one hundred eight pound division in Japan, we have the most top talents、uh, in the world in this division. We do believe so.、Uh, but one thing that's certain is that throughout this Grand Prix, we have definitely seen the alternation of generations.、We've、definitely seen that.、Um, you know, obviously Izawa. Many people thought Izawa was the favorite, but for Park to beat Kana Asakura and then beat. Ayaka Hamasaki to make it to the finals. You know that just shows how the the era is the sport is changing, 
And it definitely shows that the new younger generation are, are taking over. So, you know, if, if Izawa takes this entire Grand Prix, that kind of concludes what we've been doing here at the Super Atomweight division. And, uh, you know, that's something that, that can conclude a story, but, you know, we might have something else uh, to move on. But throughout this Grand Prix, we have definitely seen the change of generations, and, and that's a fact. Yeah, definitely some very talented, you know, young ladies coming up. Sekizawa, very impressive, and as is uh, Park, of course. And unfortunately, we did miss out on, you know, Reina competing against uh, the champion in Sayaka. Here she had, uh, what, the injury from her first fight. And so I'm just kind of curious, Sekibara, is the idea maybe to have her fight the winner of the tournament now? Or do you think, uh, depending on when she's ready, just what are you kind of thinking for uh, Reina's return? So a lot of this will have to do um, based off of the results of and how the fight goes with the uh, the finals against Izao and Park. You know, the super atom weight, uh, the, the future of the super atom weight division will definitely rely on, on the results of uh, New Year's Eve. You know, and and sadly, Rena is not. The, the division is not revolving around Rena anymore. And, you know, that might be one of the reasons why we're seeing this alternation of generations. You know, she's not part of, she, the division is not revolving around her. And, you know, like she cannot start. She's at a point where she cannot make an action. She has to make a reaction of what's going on. So... I think it all depends on, you know, what she wants to do and how the Super Atom White division pans out. So I think, uh, you know, she's going to have to adapt to, to, to what's going on in the division. And be, be, depending on who becomes champion, who is the champion in the Super Atom White division, you know, we might just conclude a story in this division and move on. So a lot of it, you know, it's, it's fluctuating. But as for Reyna, you know, she needs to figure out where she wants to be, um, in order to keep herself involved with, with everything that's going on. Yeah, absolutely, definitely going to be a bit of a waiting game to see how things shake out. But also on Ryzen 38, we saw, you know, Kyoji Horiguchi come back with a great win in the main event over uh, Kintaro there. So I'm curious, Akibara, you know, now he's out of his own tournament that was going on in Bellator, like, is the hope for him to defend the title next, maybe at New Year's Eve or something like that? Or do you think that he'll go back uh, to Bellator before he does end up uh, defending the Ryzen title again? Yes, as far as Horiguchi goes, you know, it's more about uh, this is something that is not just Kyoji's, you know, uh, not responsibility, but like his idea. This is more about, you know, we need to talk to Scott Coker. It's more about a Bellator and Ryzen. What Bellator and Ryzen does next will definitely involve Kyoji. So this is something that we cannot directly uh, decide on our own. You know, it has to be done through a lot of uh, uh, communications with, uh, with Scott Coker. And depending on which direction that we want to head in, you know, it's going to change what Kyoji is going to be doing uh, based off of our decisions. So this is something that we need to talk about and uh, figure out in order to to determine what, what his next steps are. You know, Kyoji already mentioned uh, after the fight that he, you know, he would really want to fight at flyweight, but Beltra doesn't have that division, you know. So there's a lot of things to consider and a lot of things to get need to pan out uh, before uh, we make these decisions on, on, on Kyoji's future. Yeah, certainly makes sense. And with all that in mind, Sakibara, last thing I'll leave you with here, man. Like, are there any big plans you can share for us for New Year's Eve? Uh, is there the Bellator collaboration going to be coming back this year? Is that possible or just anything that you can uh, tease us with for uh, how you're going to close out this year? <laughs> yeah, more. What are lady this? Well, let me let me leave you with this. Uh, we're we're ready to we're ready to work with them, and uh, you know it's we, when you look through the industry, it's Bellator and Ryzen who are the only two brands who are willing to work together uh, and and cooperate to put on events, uh, something put on something big for the fans. You know, like exchanging fighters, doing some uh, brand promoting, uh, team versus team, and uh, you know I think we are the only 
promoters who can make this new movement and create something new that nobody else is doing. So, you know, obviously it's, you know, we have to run our own business. So a lot of things have to make sense in a way. So we've been talking to Scott uh, for a long time about the idea, talking about ideas, possibilities, you know, and uh, we've been talking about it for a long time. And, you know, we're, we're, we do believe that, you know, the, the Scott, Scott definitely holds the key here. So, um, but like I said, you know, in the current industry, we are the only ones who can do something and we can, we are the only ones who can make something new. So, you know, the rest you can, you can ask Scott and see what he says. But um, yeah, we'll leave it there, but we'd love to do something and we are, we are ready for it. Yes. And the fans would absolutely love to see it. It is always a good time, you know, getting people together and working together. So fingers crossed that uh, you can pull off something here soon. But until that happens, Saki Gabara, it's always a pleasure getting to chat, man. It's always very fun just talking about the world of MMA and things going on in Ryzen. So I appreciate you greatly for taking the time. Big thank you. Big arigato gozaimashita as always, sir. And I wish you the best of luck with things going forward. Uh, we'll always be tuning in. So just thank you so much for the time. And I hope you have a great rest of the day, sir. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Fresh off his big upset victory over Hiro Masa Ogikubo, it's Su Chol Kim. All right. Well, it is great to see you, Su Chol, man. Congratulations on the very big win uh, at Ryzen this past weekend. So I just got to know how you're doing today. Uh, happy, what is it, Friday for you? <laughs> uh, thank you for celebrating. I mean, thank you for uh, uh, everything. Uh, uh, it's uh, I'm also happy that I have a big win, but um, wasn't KO knockout, but I'm still happy that I at that win against Ogi Korea. Yes, it was definitely a very <laughs> impressive performance nonetheless, man. And I mean, just with all that in mind, like, did you do anything special to celebrate or do you like to kind of treat the victories as all the same? Uh, uh, he said, uh, it's the same. It's the same. He feels the same. Not too good, not too bad. You know, he just had another win and that's it. He's got to fight again. So it's the same. He didn't do anything special for that win. Well, I mean, we can argue with that, man. It was, you know, beating a guy like him who won the tournament last season in Ryzen. Pretty big deal. So, I mean, just as for the fight itself, like, did that play out how you kind of expected it to? I know you wanted to finish in, and you got pretty close there uh, at a point, you know, whether it was by finishing him yourself or with the doctors looking at his eyes. So you did some real damage. Like, did the fight go and meet your expectations in terms of what happened in there? Um... 뭐 일단 시합에서 어, 사실 어, 어, 예, 어, 무시하는 I didn't look down on him, but he thought the fight would be easier than what actually happened there. Uh, he was looking for finish, but in the first round, it was all different from what he thought. So in the second round, he he looked for finish, but he couldn't do it. 초반부터 그렇게 빗나갔죠. 그래서 yeah, we we'll definitely got close, like I said there, man, and we're able to do a good amount of damage and secure the win. So that's all that matters in the end, right? And, you know, with that in mind, like, where do you kind of rank this one amongst your uh, biggest career wins? So you've had some great ones in your career, uh, you know, beating a guy like Hiro Masa. Is this the best one you've had yet? Or uh, do you think something else was a little bit better? Uh, yeah, I wouldn't say this was the best. He fought Bibiano, he also fought Mullen Sandro. Uh, he couldn't beat those fighters, but definitely I wouldn't say this was the best. But uh, I'm looking for something better against Kyoji or other fighters rising would bring it, uh, bring to him. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, next for the next fight, he's looking for better ones. Of course, man. Always got to keep climbing upward, and uh, you're doing a good job of that, obviously. And, you know, it's kind of crazy, Suchol, man. You look at your Ryzen debut was back in kind of the beginning of when things kicked off in 2015, and then you came back here for this one. Like, how did kind of the experiences uh, compare here? Was it a lot different all these years later coming to Ryzen compared to when you uh, made your debut for them uh, in 2015? Okay, like what uh, Quentin Jackson said about uh, aging, you know, I came here seven years, uh, I'm seven years older than 
before. Uh, I'm now really older than uh, I am back in uh, 2015. Uh, yeah, I'm taking, uh, I've been working a lot, uh, I've, been, I've been working out a lot and uh, I've been taking a lot of vitamins and amino to be better all the time for the next fight. <laughs> Absolutely, man. We saw that in the uh, last performance. It's uh, working out for you. And mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned uh, what you might want next and uh, the potential for a Kyoji Horiguchi fight, who, you know, he's the champ right now and he just... Uh, on the same card, you know, got back in the win column, beat Kentaro in the main event. Good stuff from him, too. Uh, and beating mm -hmm. a guy like Hiro Masa, who was, you know, the tournament winner, like I said, from last year. People kind of thought, all right, maybe he'll jump right into uh, his trilogy with Kyoji. But now that you beat him, like, you think that you're pretty deserving of uh, the title fight with Kyoji next, if that can happen? Or uh, do you expect maybe they'd give you another big name instead? Uh, I'm not rising, so I don't really know what they're thinking. But I'm waiting. Uh, I already called Kyoji, but they might give me someone else. So I'm gonna get ready. Uh, yeah, I wanted to work. I wanted to train this week, but yeah, but I'll take this week off and I'll start training again from next week for the next fight. Of course, man. Earned a little break after the big win, of course. And is there any interest at all to pursue maybe the featherweight title, Suchil? Because, you know, you are the featherweight champion in Road FC, right? So you've kind of been able to do both divisions in your careers, bantamweight and featherweight. Is there any idea to maybe go after that one in Ryzen if, uh, if possible? Okay, uh, yeah, of course, of course he is, he wants to go to featherweight because he was basically expecting a featherweight fight in Road FC, but he's got an offer from uh, Rising in Bantamweight, so he had to lose weight quickly. During the course, he, uh, he had sm stomach illness. So, yeah, uh, after, you know, um, winning title or finishing my journey in Bantamweight, he wants to go to featherweight, you know, he's getting older and, uh, uh, yeah, it's not easy for him to lose weight, cut weight. Understandable, man. And yeah, getting older in fight years, maybe, what, 12 years as a professional now, which is a good dozen of an accomplishment to have, man. But right in the prime in terms of the numbers, though, just 30 years old still. So pretty young right in that middle area, uh, right? And, you know, you fought all in Asia, Suchil. Uh, I'm curious, do you have any goals to, you know, if anything arises, maybe possibilities of uh, competing in the USA at some point? You know, there's Ryzen has the deal with, uh, or the friendship at least, with Bellator. So they've seen fighters go back and forth there. Would that ever be something that uh, you think would be fun to be a part of? He thinks he thinks it's excellent, you know, as long as they pay me good. Yeah, he's going to do anything. He, he's going to have a newborn baby next year. So, yeah, uh, if they pay me right, he's going to do it. All right, cool. Congrats on the impending fatherhood then, man. That's uh, definitely uh, an exciting thing. I mean, how excited are you for that? Um, at first, uh, I thought my life was over, but after thinking about it, uh, yeah, after uh, after the baby is born, you know, it's going to be really, I'm going to be happy to see him, you know, taking care of him. Uh, you know, um, I'm just imagining, you know, the happy thoughts, happy things about uh, life with the baby. Absolutely, man. Very exciting. So congratulations on that again as you get ready for dad life, man. Going to be fun. So <laughs> very cool. Very cool. And, you know, Suchil, right now, like you're one of the best fighters from your country and we're seeing some great things uh, come out of Korea. I mean, on the same card, um, Siwoo Park, you know, your fellow countrywoman, she's doing amazing right now. She's going to the finals in her tournament uh, to fight the champion. So, like, for you, man, I'm curious, how important is it for you to, like, strongly represent your country and be, you know, kind of maybe a good role model for the rest of the fighters and just uh, people from your country in general? So, 
Yeah, uh, I think I'm lucky to represent my country by fighting the uh, fighting the ring. Uh, I wanna I wanna show other people, other fighters, or just other people that uh, there's a life like this that I live. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm proud of my life, and uh, yeah, I wanna show, I wanna I wanna say that you know there's a kind of life like this that I lived. And how did you get into MMA in the first place? So, so, you know, everyone has kind of their different stories and journeys of how they got into being a fighter, you know, a very unique uh, kind of career path or profession mm -hmm. to have. So like for you, was it kind of something you always wanted to do from when you were a kid or just how did uh, how did you get into this in the first place? I want to be short because it's a long story. Uh, he loves playing fighting games, Tekken, Street Fighter, King of Fighters. So as I play those games, you know, uh, I see all these um, muscular characters. And uh, he wanted to be like that. Uh, but then uh, he fought some of the, he saw some of the footages of Fedor and all, all these other classic fighters. And he decided to be like that. And he found this Road FC gym five minutes away from his home, so he jumped right in. All right, very cool, man. Some uh, good inspirations there, indeed. Can't go wrong with some of those classic fighting games. And Fedor, like you said, I mean, with that in mind, like, would you say he has been one of your inspirations or favorite fighters, or maybe are there some other ones that uh, come to mind when you think of those guys who had a big impact on you? Yeah, uh, I say Fedor because he's one of the representative, you know, of the sport back then. Mm. But he loves Yamamoto, Kid Kid Yamamoto. Uh, he, he loves Mitrius Johnson, George St. Pierre, mm. and Kyoji, personally. Yes, all some legends right there. Good choices, man. Love watching them fight as well. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, man, awesome stuff. And, you know, we mentioned how uh, you kind of start, you were around for the start of the Ryzen uh, promotion mm -hmm. as well as you chill in the first, what, the second event, right? Mm -hmm. But, uh, mm -hmm. you know, in MMA, you've practically grown up with Road FC too. You were on their very first show and been competing at practically every one of them since then, man. So I just kind of want to know what that experience has been like you know, growing up in MMA practically with Road FC, and, you know, you've helped build it up because you've been such a big star for them and have done so well. Yeah, I grew up, yeah. Uh, with the Road FC and the build-ups with the with the MMA promotions, I love that experience. Uh, fighting in other promotions, like one, you know, uh, getting the title was a good experience. Uh, I had a hard time training for MMA fights, uh, but all those hard times, now I think it's all good memories. Certainly, man, it has been a great career and one that continues to go onward and finding some great success. So looking forward to seeing what does come next for you, man. But before I let you get out of here, I want to, you know, I'm curious about some outside MMA stuff. You know, you mentioned video games uh, maybe in the younger days, but I'm curious, do you have any hobbies or passions outside of combat sports, Suchil? Some things that you really like to do when you're not busy training and whatnot. Uh, game, my will. Without those mm -hmm. games, um... He he travels around with his wife, uh, but uh, he traveled abroad a lot. But you know, because of COVID nineteen, he couldn't go anywhere for the last year. Uh, nowadays, they uh, he he and his wife travel around in Korea, go to seaside, you know, go to those ancient stuff. And he loves eating out um, at a at a good restaurants. Oh, yeah, I can't go wrong with some good food there, man. But since you mentioned the traveling, uh, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of beautiful things you've got to see, some cool sights. If you had to recommend one spot for a tourist, like if I was to come and visit South Korea, what would be the number one spot you'd recommend to uh, check out while I was there? Yeah, uh, I would recommend uh, ancient capital Gyeongju. has a lot of big tombs and a lot of big things. Anyway, he uh yeah, a lot of big things you you'll see like uh like tombs he said. <laughs> All right, definitely very cool. A little bit of history is always fun. So I'll keep that in mind for uh, when I eventually make the trip there, but I appreciate it greatly Suchil. So All right, man. Well, I will leave you off there. I appreciate you taking the time so much. I want to congratulate you again 
on the big victory and becoming a father here soon. Congrats on that. Very cool, man. Exciting stuff. You got a lot going on. So a busy guy, I can imagine. So I just want to say thank you so much again for chatting. It was great, man. And I look forward to seeing whatever's next for you, no matter where it is, uh, which cage or ring it is in. You're an exciting fighter to watch, man. So I wish you the best of luck with everything going forward. <laughs> thank you. We couldn't have episode 20 without the goat herself, Megumi Fuji. Uh, congratulations on your uh, second year anniversary. Thank you. Thank you, Megumi. Yeah, it's <laughs> had to bring you back. You know, it's great to see you another year down, right? Last time we talked, I had my big crazy hair. It's gone now, as you can see. So uh, another year down. I mean, just how, how have things been since we last caught up? So this and then. So Drake, yeah, things have, have not changed too much uh, on my end, but uh, my daughter is going to be having a match this weekend. Oh, really? Okay. I'm sure that's exciting for you. Uh, a little nervous, I imagine. How 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 excited are you for that? <laughs> yeah, I get very nervous, so I cannot corner her. I always have my husband corner her. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I have to watch from afar. <laughs> and uh, how old is she now? He's six. Okay, all right. So, yeah, good for her, you know, staying active, <laughs> learning after mom and dad. Very cool. Uh, did you guys get to do a lot of fun things for uh, the summer as a family? So, yeah, we went to the river and did some barbecues. We went, uh, we went to the ocean. We did a lot of swimming uh, with, my, with my daughter, with our daughter this year. <laughs> yeah, very fun. Some good summer activities for sure. And oh, you mentioned the nerves of Saku Chan's match, but you know, Shinji also has a fight coming up, but uh, what his second fight in Ryzen? That's very cool, very exciting. Uh, are you more nervous for, I imagine, <laughs> Saku's match coming up, but or do you get nervous as well for, uh, you know, Shinji's fights, or is it kind of like, you know, he's obviously had a full career himself, kind of used to seeing him fight by now? Just uh, how do you kind of compare the two in terms of when you're, you know, getting ready for those as a family member? So, uh, you know, ever since we've gotten married, you know, Sasaki has been, he's been working out. He's been training six days a week, nonstop. And, you know, his life as, as, as a fighter, you know, he has continued that rather he has a fight or not so just because the fight has been confirmed it's it's like nothing has really changed um as far as his everyday routine goes so you know we try not to think uh, about any negative stuff before a fight um you know because that affects uh us mentally so we just try to stay positive and just continue to do what we do so it's uh, you know, that, kind of, it's that kind of mentality for Sasaki. Yeah, totally understandable and you know, Megumi, last time we caught up, we talked a bit about like that coach and kind of fighter dynamic of, you know, fighters who are you know, dating each other in relationships or whatever. But I, I actually have never asked you, how did you guys uh, meet in the first place? Is there a, a fun story there? <laughs> uh, so, uh, you know, when I was, uh, when I was competing, I was, uh, I would station myself in, in Tokyo. And Sasaki was located in Fukuyama, different parts of Tokyo, uh, Japan. So uh, we, re we really didn't have direct contact at all. But uh, we had the a mutual sponsor, the same sponsor. We were sponsored by the same uh, apparel company in Spirit. And uh, when they had their filming session amongst, uh, with all their fighters, that's when we first met. We talked about it. Uh, we talked a little bit. Um, where he lives, Fukuyama, happened to be very close to where I where I grew up in. So um, my hometown was very close to where he lives. So, you know, we started talking about uh, once I go back, you know, can, can we train together? You know, can I train at your gym, etc. And, you know, that, that was kind of the beginning. Okay. So did you guys then, you know, get together in a relationship when you were still fighting Megumi or was it kind of right after? Like I'm trying to figure out the timeline here a little bit. I think it was right before... Uh, Right before I retired, so um, yeah, it, it was probably a, some somewhere in a period where I was, you know, still active. But uh, we lived in totally different cities, so 
you know, we didn't really see each other. And, you know, back then we didn't have these types of tools to, to communicate. So it was just mostly just calling each other on the phone. But uh, yeah, I think it was right around that, my, my retirement fight or somewhere around that. Okay. Okay. Well, I, I only ask because I'm very curious, you know, how you think that having, you know, that relationship, that stability, th this different kind of stability in your life throughout your whole career would have maybe changed things. Do you think it would have been, you know, more helpful to have, you know, a fellow fighter as your partner throughout your entire career? Or maybe would that have been more of a distraction? Like, I know it's a big what if situation, but I'm curious how you think uh, that might have changed things for you as a fighter. So, you know, so, so for me, I, I think it was, it was perfect as it was. I don't really you know, uh, think I, I should change anything looking back in the past. But you know, obviously, uh, you know, when, when there's relationships amongst fighters, um, there's so many different ways of, you know, each, each couple could uh, treat, treat themselves. You know, there are fighters who, uh, their relationships where they trade exchange uh, techniques and all that kind of stuff, strategy to do everything together. But for me, I, I just kind of wanted to uh, do my own thing. I didn't really like to be told on like uh, uh, techniques and whatnot, strategy, but so Saki definitely, you know, helped me out mentality, you know, mentally, um, to point me in the right direction when my, when my head wasn't in the right place, you know, he'd kind of guide me through uh, mentally, but um, I think we were able to keep a good, good balance, um, even though we're both fighters, we didn't really get into each other's uh, technique and, and uh, game plans. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's hard to deny. And obviously, you had one of the best careers you possibly could have had, as is Megumi. So uh, <laughs> definitely maybe best to not change anything. It's all working out pretty well. But uh, it's a transition to, you know, some other fighters that you're very close with. Obviously, Ayaka Hamasaki, who we're all friends and, you know, fans of as well. Uh, you know, unfortunately, had a, a tough loss in the last fight with Sivu Park. I'm just curious to know, I haven't spoken to her yet myself, but she broke her arm right and just had surgery. So uh, how is she doing? I'm sure you're keeping in touch with her uh, after the fight and the injury. So, so yeah, I was uh, messaging her with her back and forth the day of the surgery. And uh, she was saying that because the surgery starts at 7 p.m., I mean, Hamasaki being as, a, as an active person as she is, she said that wait, waiting around uh, in the hospital until 7 p.m. Was, was the most painful thing like, um, for her. Um, but, at, you know, the, uh, the surgery went well. She came out of surgery, um, obviously, right after the fight and... Uh, you know, she, it, was, it was very inconvenient for her. She was in lots of pain. But, and, uh, but after the surgery, um, everything was all uh, bolted in now. And the swelling has gone. And the pain is, has eased down a bit. So she's back to doing her regular uh, life right now. All right. Well, that's good to hear. And definitely sounds like Ayaka, a true uh, trooper. You know, she's uh, going to continue on the best she can. But I mean, before that fight, uh, Megumi, she took on and, you know, beat your old pal, uh, Jessica Aguilar, which it was really cool, you know, for me getting to see you guys reunite a little bit and, you know, catch up uh, for the event and the fight week. I mean, I talked to Jessica about it. She said it was really cool getting to see you and felt like, you know, a full circle moment in her career, which, uh, you know, obviously makes a whole lot of sense. But for you, like, how cool was it getting to see Jessica again? Was that a, a special thing for you? So this is so I fought Jessica twice. I know how, you know, I personally know uh, how tough she is, you know, and uh, for me, you know, that my, my retirement fight uh, against Jessica, it ended by, you know, unfortunately by an eye poke, you know, I'm, I'm okay with it. I've, I've come to, to, to live with it, but, you know, deep inside, it's still, it wasn't like a full, fully digested, you know, fight. You know? So there's that part of me that that's always had that little, that little thorn inside myself about that fight. Um, and then, you know, obviously, uh, Hamasaki was supposed to fight her back in 2011, got canceled in a very dramatic way. And, you know, for, for, for us three to, to be in the same area after all these years, it's definitely something, you know, it, emotionally, it's very something special. And, um, I, I think uh, from from my point of view, I know how just how tough Jessica was, so I really didn't want to be facing her in the first uh, the first round of the tournament. 
Um, but when you look around and, and think about the storylines, when you think of everything, you know, it just made sense. And uh, I think Hamasaki also felt like she didn't want anybody else to beat Jessica before she did. So, you know, we, we both talked about it and, and uh, we accepted the fight and just said that we're going to have to, you know, we're going to have to do this. So in many ways, it was very, you know, very emotional and there, there's, uh, there's, there's definitely a special thing about that fight. Yeah, it definitely made for a very cool story, you know, with not only their history, but, uh, you know, yours as well linked into it. It was just like a big old, just a crazy thing in terms of, you know, the history for the women. So it was definitely awesome to see. But, um, you know, you mentioned the tournament right there. And I want to get your thoughts on, you know, the champion right now, Seka Izawa, who obviously had her two fights with, uh, you know, Hamasaki as well and beat her, which was crazy at the time. But, you know, she's continued to look very much like she uh, is rightfully the champion so and still very young megumi and her story is kind of crazy how quickly she's got into ma and where she is now so i'm just very fascinated by her journey and how talented she is but i want to know from your perspective like what do you make of you know this this fighter who's on the rise right now in uh the current champion so this net on uh so I think uh, she kind of reminds me of a fighter called Miku, who uh, who be quickly became a rising star and became a champion uh, back in the day. Um, you know, she's, uh, her creativity, the way she fights, their style definitely reminds me of Miku. But uh, I also I also think that she has something that's that's natural. You know, uh, it's definitely something that that's that's gifted because um, you know she has a background of judo, uh, sumo, and then M uh, MMA. But if you think about, I'm sorry, in wrestling. But if you think about, if you had all those all those three combinations, would would everybody turn out to be like he's awesome? I, I don't I don't think so because she has she's, she's very good at uh, bonding those three techniques together and uh, utilizing it in her own way. So she she has that she has that uh, that intuition to put these all these skill sets together. So that that's I think that's what makes her special. Yeah, couldn't agree more. And I'm assuming you mean Miku Matsumoto from back in the day, right? She was the most popular Miku that comes to mind. Yes, Miku Matsumoto. <laughs> okay, all right, yes. <laughs> and uh, before I let you go here, Megumi, I know we're strapped on time a little, but I could talk to you forever. But I'm curious, uh, do you you keep up much with MMA in the U.S. right now? Like uh, you, the UFC in particular, like do you still keep up at all with uh, what's going on over there? So I don't necessarily follow the UFC right now, but uh, I do watch them occasionally. Um, you know, the gym, the gym members would you know bring bring over DVDs of previous events. Uh, we'd look over for some techniques and, and stuff like that. But I don't really, I don't, I don't think I can get the faces and, and names to match. Um, but I, I watch for for you know techniques and stuff. And obviously, if there's women's fights, I'll watch those. But um, yeah, I don't necessarily uh, necessarily follow it, but I do pay attention. Okay. All right. Well, that is totally fine. I was only asking, though, because I'm curious, you know, one of your past opponents uh, that you fought in Bellator, Carla Esparza, you know, she's the champion once again uh, in the UFC strawweight division two times now that she's done this. And it's just kind of crazy when you look at, you know, the longevity that she's had and, you know, fighting you like in what her fourth or fifth fight and then going on to have this career that she's had. I'm just kind of, you know, wanted to get your thoughts on how her career has played out. And like, if you would have assumed that she'd been able to be in this spot all these years later, you know, after uh, you fought her back in the day. So this and some yeah, she's been in this for a long time, and uh, I was definitely rooting for her because you know she's she's been competing at the uh, the top end for for such a long time. I think when we fought, it was like her third or fourth fight, but uh, she's been in it for a long time, and then you know she's. She loses some, uh, and then she, she wins some. So for me, you know, for her to be, she's not a big girl. She's not tall. She's not. She's short, but she still performs and she performs well. So for me, you know, she gives us hope that you know us Asians who are not too big or who have small frames can can compete at that level. So you know, I've always been rooting for her, and, and it was definitely inspiring when I saw her get that belt for the second time. Yeah, she's definitely one of the smaller straw weights, that is for sure. So uh, she's doing the smaller girls proud indeed. But always great getting to catch up. 
But, um, you know, of course, we will again in the future. It is always a fantastic honor and pleasure speaking with the greatest of all time. Thank you oh so much. I cannot thank you enough. A big arigato gozaimash to every single time, Megumi. Uh, wish you all the best with uh, Saku's match. Um, I know you'll be very nervous in Shinji's match. I know it'll be fun. So uh, it is always a pleasure, Megumi. I hope you have a great weekend. And, uh, yeah, just everything that you got going on in life right now. I appreciate you. あ、私のこそ時々ですがこうやって顔見て話ができて楽しいです。いつもありがとうございます。あの、娘とだんなのサポート頑張ってきます。いい報告できるように頑張ります。Drake, thank you so much for being able to, you know, uh, talk to talk to me occasionally and uh, you know, I'll, I'll work hard on supporting Saku, my daughter and my husband. So, uh, I, I appreciate your your time and uh, hopefully I can we can talk next time and give you good results. And closing things out, it is the Ryzen featherweight champion and deep featherweight champion, Juntaro Ushiku. All right, Juntaro. Well, it's good to see you, man. Good to see you, champ. Uh, just how are things How are things going as we get ready for another big fight for you? Just how is life uh, over there for you? Yeah, I feel great. Um, I'm ready to fight. And uh, so I've been preparing myself well, so I, I can fight any time. Awesome to hear, man. Very excited for this one. And I got to know, summer's coming to an end now. But did you get to ride your Harley a good amount uh, where the, when there was nice weather out? Yeah, well, I mostly had to train. So uh, I, would, I would ride my bike uh, occasionally to, to kind of wind, you know, wind down. Of course, man. Of course. Got to take, uh, take in the moments when it presents itself. But are you a big traveler in general, Juntaro? Like, do you like to go around and see new places or are you just pretty comfortable in uh, the space that you're used to? Yeah, I like going out and uh, seeing new places, experiencing new things. And it helps me refresh and reset things. So I like to go outside and travel. Yeah, absolutely, man. And in terms of like the whole world, do you have any specific uh, locations on the bucket list that you're you know, really hoping to go see one day, whether it's a specific country or a city in Japan that you've never been to? Yeah, I feel like I want to visit uh, the United States again. That's, that's one thing. I have All right, cool. When was the last time you were there? I went to go train about four or five years ago. Okay, all right. Yeah, so that's been a good amount of time, man. It would be nice to get back for sure and do some more traveling, especially as things are, you know, pretty open once again. But, you know, before uh, you do that, obviously I have a task at hand here, man. And, you know, we haven't talked since your last fight when you had the rematch with Yutaka Saito, you know, another great performance by you, another victory, title defense, all that good stuff. I mean, just uh, from your perspective, you know, were you happy with your performance? You know, get, have plenty of time to look back on it now. Just what did you make of uh, your most recent performance? You know, I feel like uh, I, I could have went for the finish. I feel like uh, I had some chances where I could be a little more aggressive. Um, but yeah, that's, that's my overall thoughts from that fight. All right, yeah, certainly fair enough, man. I mean, I'm sure it's kind of tricky whenever you're going against someone you fought before and, you know, maybe trying not to overassess the things that you were used to seeing the first time. Is that coming to play at all when you're kind of mentally in the fight? Yeah, so I think it goes, you know, both ways. Uh, we've definitely fought and we know what we can do. Um, so, you know, we, we definitely think about what, cards they're going to play how, how they're going to fight uh the strategy wise so um you have to think of what they're thinking in order to, to come up with a game plan yeah, absolutely man and this is always something i like to talk about with fighters but you know there's the mental side versus the physical side right and some people believe it goes in one direction more than the other some will say it's 50 50 between the mental and physical sides of the sport but how do you feel about it juntaro do you think it's uh, one over the other or are they about the same yeah, I think you need a you need a good balance. So I would say 50-50 because you know if you have that mentality and you don't train, you won't be able to perform. And if you overtrain, if you don't have the mentality, you know it, you, you might you might fold during the fight. So I think you know I I look at it that it's 50-50. I need a good balance in order to one one to complement the other. And you know it's interesting. I've been thinking about this lately too. Like you know whenever we see fighters do their interviews and whatnot and uh, sometimes you know the interviewer will ask oh you know how's camp going 
never do we see a fighter say, oh, it's been terrible, you know, like it sucks. It's always, it's been a good camp, which of course, you know, you don't want to say that things are not going well, but it makes me curious, man, like being a champion yourself and everything, like how, how do you describe like a good camp? What makes it good? Because they're always hard, right? It's always a difficult time preparing to fight somebody, but like what makes it good though? <laughs> So I think uh, at the beginning of fight camp, we talk to our coaches and team and uh, we come up with a goal per, per, uh, during our fight camp of what to accomplish. And uh, if I, if I can go, uh, if I can reach all these goals during fight camp without injuries, and uh, if I can meet every criteria that, that we, that we talked about, um, that makes it a good fight camp. Okay, all right. That is some excellent insight. That is kind of, uh, yeah, what I would have assumed because, I mean, it's always difficult, right? Like, it's never easy work because, you know, you're always wanting to be your best and strive to be better and better. So it's difficult, but I, I understand what you're saying there. <laughs> and, you know, it's interesting too, Juntaro. Uh, you're not just the champ of Ryzen, but you're also the deep champ. And I want to know, like, two great belts. So I'm curious, do you have a preference to which one you like better, whether it's the aesthetic or the story behind how you want it? Do you uh, like one belt over the other? <laughs> yeah, so both both belts mean a lot. They're both equally uh, memorable and important to me. Obviously, without the, without the deep belt, I wasn't able, I would I wouldn't be able to challenge the Ryzen you know the belt. And uh, so in that in that case, you know, it's very important to me. Um, as for the Ryzen belt, you know, I I was definitely under underdog. I was I was put in there to. The odds were against me, but I was able to overcome those odds and become champion. So that's a very important part of my uh, part of my uh, career accomplishments as well. Yeah, can't really go wrong with either of them, man. You've had a good journey up until this point and going on strong. And you know, since we last talked as well, Juntaro, your teammate, uh, a fellow double champ of Deep and Ryzen, uh, Seke Izawa, has continued to have great success herself. And you know, having watched you know her train and been close to her, like. I imagine that it's not surprising to you to see her continue to be as good as she has and now going into the Ryzen Super Atomweight Finals. But like from your perspective, though, like how cool is it to see, you know, both of you guys continue to do very well, but you notice her path at such a young age. I, I, uh, I have a lot of uh, great things uh, to say about her. Um, I've watched her train. She trains hard. Um, she puts in a lot of effort and she, she listens to the coach, too. So that's one thing that uh, I really uh, respect about her uh, because I, I see that every day and I see her worth ethics up, up, up close. So I've got nothing but respect for her. Yeah, absolutely, man. It's been really great to watch both your guys' journeys. Uh, you know, thus far, like I said, and excited to see what the future holds. And immediately for you, man, uh, obviously it's the Clever Koike matchup. Main event of Ryzen 39. Very exciting stuff. Big, big fight, you know. A very dangerous guy. Uh, he's obviously got the ties to the lightweight champion. I'm sure you've been watching his career, both of their careers, I'm sure. But getting to fight a guy like Clever, just what do you make of this matchup, uh, man? Is it? Would you say it's one of the more dangerous ones that you've had in your career? Yes, without a doubt, he's definitely the uh, the toughest challenger that I'm 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 gonna face throughout my career, up up leading up to here. So yeah, I'm very fascinated too, just kind of by the element of facing a specialist like him, Jutaro. You know, he's obviously incredibly great with his jujitsu striking is getting better, but we see that that's you know maybe his weakness at least compared to his ground game, which is so good. So I'm curious for you, like, would you say that? Facing these guys who are super good at one thing is more difficult or is it kind of maybe easy because you know, not easy necessarily, but easier because you know that's what I need to avoid as best as I can. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a really tough question, but, uh, but because you know what to expect, um, it is it is easier to come up with a game plan. Okay. And so like, I'm curious though, at the same time, is there kind of that pride inside of you? That's like, well, I would like to see how I can do in that area with him. You know, even though it might not be the best path to victory, like that would be a great victory within a victory to, you know, be able to test yourself there and then come out, you know, on top still. 
Yeah, so I have, I have no plans or I don't have any intentions for that because, you know, this is MMA. And、uh, in MMA, you have to fight where you, you feel comfortable at and you have to fight where you're, you're confident at. So、uh, that's, that's how I fight. Yes, gotta fight smart, lower the risk as best as you can. And、uh, that's definitely the way to do it in these k i n d of situations. So, a champion like answer there, Juntaro. So, I totally get you. But it's interesting, too, man, when you look at k i n d of where we've gotten to now and all the success that you're having. Like, there was one point a couple years ago, you know, where you were on your first and only losing streak as a professional fighter. And I'm just k i n d of curious, like, I'm sure that was you know, a tough time for you and a lot of learning went on. But I'm curious, just like, how much did you learn and take away from that? Time in your career that helped make you, you know, the fighter you are today and the champion you are today? Yeah, I did. There were some takeaways from that for sure.、Um, you know, my whole way of approaching fight camp and training, I had to, I had to readjust that and、uh, how, to, how to prepare myself mentally for a fight, how to prepare myself、uh, during training. You know, there, there's a lot that I learned from that. Absolutely, I can imagine, man. And you know, you had a very busy year last year with the four fights that you had, and you know, at gonna be two after this one coming up here. And I'm curious, are you gonna try and fit one in more,、uh, put one more in after this, you know, if you're all fine and not injured or anything, and you know, could maybe squeeze in on the new year card, or just typically, I guess, how active do you like to be、uh, in a calendar year? So, for me,、uh, fighting two or three times a year would be best for me. And、uh, in terms of you know, squeezing in one more, I'm really focused on、uh, each fight that comes up. So, I don't really want to think ahead. But、uh, yeah, for right now, I'm just, I'm just all focused on this upcoming fight. Yes, for sure, man. Have to be fully committed to what's right in front of you. So, I totally get that. But I want to I want to look ahead a little bit, though, if you'll allow us here just to, you know, for some fun. But, you know, in terms of your biggest career you know, goals right now at the moment, Juntaro, is there anything you kind of want to achieve in the grand scheme of t h i n g that you're really aiming for? Like, if it's you know, a certain number of title defenses, you know, as many belts as you can get, maybe go fight in Bellator, get that belt or something crazy. Like, do you have any, like, Big long term goals that you're really hoping to reach at this point.、Uh, you know, as a champion of two organizations, it's already a very good start. I think it all comes down to my upcoming fight. I think it's a very important fight for my career, and the results will definitely determine what I want to shoot for in a, in a bigger picture. So, you know, that's, that, that's all I can say for now. But yeah, this, this upcoming fight is very important for me. Yes, fair enough, man. And it's going to be a very, very exciting one. I'm totally looking forward to it.、Uh, always looking to, forward to both of your guys' fights. So, this is going to be a great one to main event the night. But we can leave it off there, Juntaro, man. It's always great getting to catch up with you.、Uh, always a fun time、uh, you know, watching you and、uh, getting to speak with you. So, I appreciate it greatly.、I'll、give you a big arigato gozaimashita just for taking this time, man. And、uh, we'll be tuning in, wishing you the best of luck with the rest of training camp in the、uh, coming weeks here and the fight itself. So,、uh, just thank you so much, man. It's always great getting to catch up. All right, Shingo, here we are once again. Another ending to an episode, a big episode 20. I really, really enjoyed this one. A lot of great guests, some familiar faces, but a lot of fun topics <laughs> that we covered and whatnot. So it's just a good time for Ryzen, a good time for MMA. A lot going on in the world of combat sports, really. So. Time for the community questions. Can't wait to get into them. Thank you so much to everybody who asked. We'll be kicking things off today with a reoccurring asker. Appreciate him so much,、uh, Mr. at Ozeki underscore Jim. We're starting things off.、Uh, he's first of four questions. He says, or he asks, This year we saw the fantastic addition of Anastasia Svetkivska to the Ryzen roster, who seems to be the best kept secret in the Uh, women's among the women in MMA, just wondering what promotions Ryzen is scouting for lesser known talent. Um, it's just you know, just connections, managers, and promoters, matchmakers all over the world. And it's, it's not like you know, a specific promotion, we just, we just talk a lot and we just talk about what's going on within our own countries, you know, the, the, the borders opening up, whatnot. Um, You know, like we have Alan Boyd fighting from EFC South Africa、uh, on this upcoming card. You know,、uh, Lara Fantara, who fought Seika Izawa, she was the other、uh, Paw Pa FC、uh, champion, Strawway champion in, in Canada. You know, so there's just there's, all these names come up and these new fighters come up as just through the, through the net, network of you know, connections and stuff. Yeah, and with Sped Gibska specifically, what she was from the 
I am a man. Yes, and I know that was something you've kind of been keeping up with just anyway. So it was like, oh, there, there's somebody, right, that we could maybe take a look at. And then here yes. we are. So just kind of staying up to date with MMA, and then you can find things out in general that way. So, all right. And then number two, he uh, asks... Or he mentioned, let's see, also arguably Su Chul Kim, who was on this episode, a good chat with him, uh, had the best performance of Ryzen 38. Are we likely to see him back, and will we see more Road FC talent? Definitely. Um, Kim Su Chul against uh, Hiromasa Oyukubo, that was probably the, the best fight of, you know, my pick. If I were to pick the best fight of the night, I would pick that fight. Um, just very high level MMA, you know, you got to see everything, uh, durability, the mental strength the fit, you know the techniques and it was just overall a great mma fight um su cho kim you know he came in he came out up top um he's always been a true competitor he's always been one of the top guys in the division so you will i think we'll definitely be see we'll be seeing more of him for sure yeah. and you know, road fc road fc is kind of back on track um you know they kind of stalled down during the COVID times but you know they still have their talents they still have their fighters under on a contract and uh uh ji on yang you know who fought in okinawa you know he he's he's another one who's gonna be fighting in november so yeah i think this relationship with road fc is uh you know we're, we're probably gonna see uh get to see more fighters yeah picking back up for sure and uh kim as he mentioned when we spoke to him i uh, said that he would like to fight the champ horiguchi after that win and i mean makes sense we'll see how things can play out there uh exciting possibilities at bantamweight always so a good addition to have as an option but uh, moving on to number three, he says, Anderson Silva said he'd like a retirement fight in Japan. Is that something Ryzen would entertain? So, Shingo, it's funny. We actually spoke about this a little bit, what, around the time Anderson got released and that was from the UFC and uh, what he was kind of talking to everybody at that time. And, you know, he, he demands a lot, right, in, in terms of certain things. So uh, <laughs> definitely Saki Gabara mentioned, I remember saying that, of course, he'd be interested. It's just a matter of making it work, kind of. So I imagine still the same case. And Anderson's probably, I don't know, his his, his stance hasn't changed, especially with what he's getting into now. <laughs> yeah, um, you know, I kind of agree with you. Um, it, it, it all has to make sense for everybody, right? Just can't benefit, uh, you know, just one party. So um, our doors are open. Um, Sakagi Barasan definitely who would love to do it, for sure. And... Uh, no, it's just about, about, you know, just if it makes sense for everybody. And uh, you know, the situation is still the same. Yes, yes. And uh, it, definitely with the the tie-in from uh, Anderson fighting in Pride, which a lot of people forget about, right? He had a couple fights in Pride. So, of course, uh, Saki Ibarra would be open to, you know, maybe doing something again. But, again, got to make sense. We'll see. He's got to worry about Jake Paul first. So that's the crazy world we're living in. <laughs> but uh, with uh, Ozeki Jim's uh, last question here, he says... Giving himself a shameless plug, says on the Yamatoda Totomashi podcast, his show with Ensign in a way, he says, uh, myself and Ensign discussed bringing in other big names for the international fans of instead of Mayweather, names like Nate Diaz, Eddie Alvarez, or maybe even a Jose Aldo. Would Ryzen ever consider bringing out the checkbook for a big U.S. name for a big pay-per-view? So, Shingo, I don't know if we have to answer this because Sakibara already pretty much answered this himself when we spoke to him about Nate Diaz specifically, who we talked about, not Alvarez or Aldo necessarily, but I'm sure the same kind of thought process falls in line there. So uh, I think it's also similar to Anderson, so I don't know if we have too much to add to that one. Yeah, it just all comes down to, you know, if it, if it makes sense for everybody. Yes, definitely having, you know, bringing in these fighters, sending these fighters would definitely help blow up interest uh, for Ryzen, you know, in the, in the international market for sure. So um, if there's some strategic, you know, value or something behind it, and if it makes sense, it would truly happen. But For sure. So just to, we'll see. We'll wait and see what happens. That's kind of how it always is. That's how it was with Floyd. That's for sure. No one saw that coming. And here we are, two fights into his his career uh, in a rising ring. Who would have thought? But, all right, appreciate your questions greatly there. Jim, a uh, good friend of the show and a great podcast of his own, as he mentioned uh, there with Ensign Inouye. But we move on to our other star of the community questions who's always up in here. Appreciate him so much. At KingCO24, he asks two questions, starting off with, will Ryzen 39 and Ryzen Landmark, Landmark 4 be on fight tv so i'm pretty sure that we answered this on the last episode to shingo but 
everything's back on Fight TV now for international fans, right? Um, yeah. Um, as far as for the events for the remaining, uh, remaining year, mm. remaining events for the year, um, uh, we're most likely going to go with Fight TV. All right. So there we go. Nice and easy. And then he says uh, Japan will reinstate visa free travel from October 11th, which is in a couple days next week. Let's see what day that is specifically as I pull up the calendar uh, Tuesday here in the U.S. Um, how much easier will it be to book foreigners now? Maybe all the fighters uh, had visas before. <laughs> no, I, mean, I mean, technically, you know, if, if you're going to fight, not even technically, if you're a fighter and if you're going to fight in Japan, you're going to need a, a business visa, right? You're going to need an entertainment visa. So that process is not going to change. But, you know, um, as far as, you know, just like entourages, like the Floyd Mayweather entourage, that, they, they would be able to come in, you know, without, without any visas. Okay. So, you know, people who are working in Japan, they're going to need their visas. So that's not going to change. But, you know, additional people um, who are there to, you know, support or there to just not work. You know, right. <laughs> um, they won't have to have to apply for visas. We won't have to apply for their visas. So, you know, that makes things a lot easier. Right. Yeah, for sure. The leeches. <laughs> the leeches, Shingo. <laughs> <That word>. <laughs> <laughs> but all right. Those are King CEO's questions. Appreciate you, man. He is the MVP of community questions. Always ever, bringing the goods. And then we move on to Philip. So I don't know uh, if he has a handle or anything, but uh, the, he put in a question. So we appreciate it. Thank you, Philip. You will know who you are. <laughs> he says, he just has one for us uh, saying Ren Hiramoto has big star potential including with the foreigner audience. His matchmaking has been filled with experienced opponents. Is Ren demanding these advanced opponents? It's, it's a, uh, I don't know how to put the word. I mean, he's always been this, uh, a big talker, right? And he's always asked for big fights. And I don't think he wants to go back to like, the normal way of matchmaking. Mm. Obviously, he's what? He's one and two? Is he one and two? I think so. He's, he's one and two or something, right? Yeah, he just won his first fight his last so one. I mean, yeah. it, would be, it would be the right kind of matchmaking to, to put him against someone with a similar record. You know? But, uh, you know, he, I think he's already came this path of, you know, I mean, he headlined a, a number series yeah. without even getting a, you know, a win. So, um, you know, I think he doesn't want to go back to like normal matchmaking, like common sense matchmaking, right? So I think he's just going to go take on these, you know, higher, higher profile opponents and see what happens. Yeah, he might yeah. Go one in eight. I don't know. He might go <laughs> one. In eight. But you know, Ren Hiramoto will still be Ren Hiramoto, and he'll he'll. I think even if he's one in ten, he'll still have a demand. I think. I mean, we'll see. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> but yeah, no, that definitely makes sense. You know, once the guy already gets off to, you know, face in this level, he's like, all right. It, it would be just so obvious now if it went back that way. So maybe it's, you know, a line of thought too. But either way, yeah, it's just uh, only, it's still very early into it. So we'll see how things do play out for sure. But thank you for that one, Philip. And then we will close out here with Jay Wolf, who we know is one of the biggest uh, rising in just Japanese MMA fans out there in the MMA community. So thank you, sir, for asking. And he is curious, will Saki Gabara release the Super Rise of pay-per-view numbers like he did for the match? Well, Shingo, I'm sure you have some kind of idea about how it did, mm -hmm. but if you can share or not, it's a different question. <laughs> I'm not sure. I mean, do we have to? I don't know. <laughs> He's asking, will he? <laughs> I mean, uh, right? You guys never really share the the numbers anyway, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. it's just you know, uh, you know, the, when we when we used to do terrestrial television, who's television? You know, right, those right. were numbers like the rating and stuff. But um, yeah, I'm not quite sure, man. I don't know how to <laughs> I don't know how to answer that question. Fair enough. So then that's uh, we'll leave it to Saki Bar, the boss. <laughs> we'll leave it to him if he wants to. But um, I mean, the match was definitely obviously a unique situation too, and he didn't even share those, right? It was um, the uh, K1 guy. Yeah, I think it was Kancho. Yeah, because I remember we talked about that when that happened too. But yeah, a little different. So <clears throat> anyway, appreciate that one, Jay Wolf. And uh, that will wrap up this session here of another community question. 
segment here uh, on the 20th episode of Broad Horizon. We appreciate all of you guys oh so much for asking them and for tuning in. 20 episodes down, crazy stuff, Shingo. The last episode was the two-year anniversary. So many guests, I don't even know the specific number that we've had, but it has been uh, quite a good run. Excited to keep it going. Thank you guys so much for the support. And uh, yeah, make sure you tune into Ryzen 39 coming up later this month uh, on October 23rd. Going to be a good one. Then Ryzen Landmark 4 is uh, November 6th, right? I got that correctly. Yep, and so we probably won't have time. We'll see if we can squeeze in another episode before then. Unlikely. Either way, we'll have one definitely after. But regardless, you guys stay tuned. We're always doing good stuff over here. And uh, yeah, appreciate the, the support so much, like I said, and we will see you next time.